cross will always represent the love God had for me. When the Lord of glory, heaven sent, gave all on Calvary, he did it just for me. He just. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, if you don't mind, um, I want everybody in this room right now, it's easy to get caught up in the redundancy of church services where we tell you all, lift your hands, praise the Lord and things like that. But worship is not like that, but we try to make it participatory so you can actually participate in it. But it's not, um, we're not cheerleaders. We are actually worshipers together. So collectively in this moment, can I get you to do one thing? Can you just think about God and how you think about him right now? And what he's done for you, how he's allowed you to come into this space right now. Just get your mind focused on that just for this moment. And just think about how good God is. You ever think about the fact that when we pray to God, we're praying to the creator of the whole entire universe. Right now in the United States of America, everybody's getting ready to watch the eclipse. But the God who created the possibility of the moon coming in front of the sun is who listens to you pray. Anybody here got something they want to say to the Lord? Uh, come on, let's think about it. Anybody got something you want to say to the Lord? If you, if, you, if you only had one thing to say, somebody told me one time, they said, Brother Seal, you know, when I make it into heaven, I'm going to ask God a lot of questions. I said, wow, I wonder how long it's going to take to you for you to get to the first question. Because I thought to myself, what question would I ask God? And then in my spirit, I said, I don't have a question. I will probably lift whatever I have as the form of a glorified body and give praise and glory to him. I don't have any questions. He's God. I just want to praise him. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Anybody here just want to love on the Lord? We're all here together. You don't have to be ashamed. There is freedom to worship the God of our salvation. We already celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But you know what? Because of what he did allows us to come into this space and freely lift our hands. Even if there's slight joint pain, if we can just sometimes just get our hands above our heads a little bit. Sometimes that's very difficult, but God, I just feel like if I could get my hands above my head, I know you see me. I know you see me. 
Thank you, Jesus. Our children need to know God. Our neighbors need to know God. We need to know the Lord. So God, here we are in this space right now. We give you glory. We give you honor. God, I have a lot of petitions on the table for you concerning children, marriage, physical healing. But God, before I ask you anything in your house, can I just say thank you? Thank you, Jesus. God, this is my opportunity right now in this moment to just give you thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for life. Thank you for being able to come into this space. Thank you for allowing me to love your people. God, what a wonderful opportunity you have given all of us in this moment to lay aside every weight, to lay aside every thought that's negative right now and concentrate on you. You are God. You are God. There's no one above you. Every answer you have, if it's healing I need, you have it, God. If it's deliverance, if it's something I need for my children, my household, God, you are God. And whatever it is that we need, God, even if I don't take the time now to ask you, I thank you because I believe it's already answered. God, thank you for answered prayers. Thank you, God. Thank you for financial blessings. Thank you, God. Thank you for healing. Thank you, God. Thank you for mending relationships. Thank you, God. Thank you for breaking bad habits. Thank you, God. If I don't ask you the question to do the thing, you've already let me know you can do the thing. And if you haven't done it yet, your ability to do it is still in place. So God, I thank you for your ability. Thank you for your ability. God, thank you because you are able. You are able. When I'm not able, God, you're able. God, you're able. God, you're able. God, you're able. God, you are able. If you don't believe anything else, know this. God is able. God is able. God is able and he won't fail. God is able. God is able. God is able and he won't Look at somebody next to you and say, God is able. God is able. God is able. And he won't, he won't fail. God is able. God is able and he, he won't, he won't fail, he won't fail, he won't fail. He won't fail. God never fails. He'll never fail. He never fails. 
Just know that God is able and he won't fail. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 1 through 5 says, Who has believed our message? Thank you, Jesus. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we hailed him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Anybody excited about the word of the Lord? By his stripes we are healed. Come on, stand on your feet and let's give God the praise he deserves. Come on, let's lift our voices and give him the praise that he deserves. Come on, we'll sing together. Come on. All right, here we go.
a good declaration to speak over your life in the morning. Simply wake up and declare without a doubt that I am healed. Listen, we just celebrated Easter Sunday, which means you can affirm and know it that Jesus paid it all so you don't have to carry it, you don't have to struggle with it, you don't have to be controlled by it, but you are already healed. Good morning, Fellowship family, and welcome to the Heart of Worship. We are so glad that you tuned in online, pressed your way into this sanctuary so that we can worship our amazing God together in spirit and in truth. We pause during this moment of our worship service to welcome those who are guests and visitors among us. We are so blessed by the presence of new guests and visitors. If you count yourself in that category, would you give us the honor of waving a hand so we can celebrate you and thank God for your presence here today? Amen, amen. Welcome, welcome. God bless you. Welcome, welcome. Listen, if this is your first time tuning in online, would you do us a favor of putting a one in the chat so we can welcome you in our virtual space. To all of you who are visitors and guests, we are so delighted that you're here. We recognize you had options as to where you could spend your Sunday morning, so we don't take it lightly that you've chosen to be here with us. If you already have a faith community and a place you call home, please send our love and our best wishes back to your church family and to your pastor. But by chance, if you're looking for a place to call home and be connected in family, know that the doors and the hearts of Fellowship Minneapolis are always open open to you, and we would love to have you join us here. Fellowship, can you help me praise God for all of our visitors and our guests on this morning? As we thank God for first-time friends, we're also grateful that on the first Sunday of the month, we get to welcome those who officially said yes to being a part of our church family, and we are excited now to welcome 12 who said yes to becoming a part of what God is doing at Fellowship Minneapolis. Fellowship family, can you help me rejoice and praise God? for sending 12 new amazing individuals our way. We are so grateful. I'm going to call their names as we celebrate. Won't you help me thank God for Sister Shauna Belcher, Belcher who comes to join our church, for Sierra Brown who's coming to be a part of our church family. Let's welcome Bertha Garrett Frazier who's coming to be a part of our church. Let's welcome Kazu Karbar who's coming and her daughter coming to be a part of our church family. Patricia Ann Longs is coming to join our church. We thank God for Alicia Mobley who's coming to join. We thank God for the Nicholson, Chastity, and Jaron who are coming to join our church family on this morning. Dana Page is coming to be a part of our church family. Let's praise God for Dana. Won't you help me thank God for Sister Faith Ross who's coming to be a part of our church family. Can we welcome the Thomases, Demetria Thomas and Tyrell as they come to be a part of our church family. Let's thank God for all of the Thomases and for Brother Allen White who's coming to be a part of our church family. Brother White, welcome, welcome. Listen to all of you, we are just so delighted and excited to call you members of our church family. This is a moment of great joy for us because we recognize that God sending you here means that God still trusts us. And we also have begun to get to know that you all have some amazing stories, some legacy, some talent, some gifts, some spiritual capacities that are going to make this church better. We believe that God is doing something here by growing our church, but that growth was not complete without you. And so I'm so grateful that God has sent you here, and I pray you will make yourself feel right at home, and most of all, do what we ask you to do during your orientation process. Please, please get involved and plugged in in the life of a ministry. You will miss, miss the rich gift of this church by only being connected on Sunday morning. There's so much more that God has in store for you, so we hope you will really get involved so you can know how special this church really is. To all of the saints here at Fellowship, aren't you excited and glad that God is still adding to your church family. I say it and I mean it. This is like the day when you bring a new one home from the hospital. This is a gift and a blessing. And we ought not take it for granted that God continues to add to our family of faith. We ought to recognize that this is a privilege, it's an honor. The fact that we are going against the trends that most churches in America are facing means that God favors us in a special way, and we never want to take that lightly. So I pray you will do this. Let's honor their gifts, their stories, their legacies. Let's wrap our arms around them. Let's get to know their names and, and learn their names the way they pronounce their names. Amen and praise God. And then go past the name to learn their story. Learn about who they are, and most of all, learn about how you can pray with and pray for them. 
Because God did not send them here to do life alone. God sent them here so that they could be experiencing the gift of what it means to be a part of an amazing church family. So we welcome them with Jesus' joy. We pray over their new chapter and season here. And we continue to believe that the best is yet to come as God continues to add to the Lord's church. Perhaps, listen, there might be somebody here and you're seeing this image and this is the reminder to you. You've never said yes to becoming part of a church family yourself. Listen, these 12 don't have to be the only Today, I would love for you to be a part of what God is doing by joining our church. We've got a new members class coming up on this Saturday. And so if you've never officially given your yes, if you know God is calling you and urging you to be a part of what God is doing here in the Lord's Church, would you stop by our welcome table in the atrium on the way out today? Sign up for Living in Rhythm class this Saturday at 9 a.m. And you can join these 12 and being a part of what God is doing in this place. Let's clap our hands and celebrate our new members one final time. And now let's stand and welcome them and each other as we sing our testimony. We love you, and there ain't a thing you can do about it. Today, many of us are bringing sorrow to this moment of worship because on Wednesday, we lost one of the dear members of our church. It's with tender sympathy and with Christian sorrow that we announce the passing of Mother Adrian Merrill Ratliff, one who was a beloved member of this church for several years. She will be missed dearly, and we will celebrate her life and her legacy in this place on Friday, April the 12th at 11 a.m. And I want to encourage all those who can be here to pray with the Merrill and Ratliff families to please join us as we celebrate her life and thank God for her legacy. I tell you this, Fellowship, I had a blessed privilege to be able to sit with her for Mother Ratliff a few times before she passed, and she told me, she said, Pastor, I'm at peace. I'm at peace because I know who my Savior is, and I know where I'm going. 
Beloved, I pray that as we come to this time of communion, we can all be reminded of the peace that we should have no matter what tomorrow may bring. For indeed, we know who our Savior is. We know the marvelous work he's done for us. And ultimately, we know where we are going because we're in relationship with him. With that in mind, I invite you to bow and be in prayer with me as Reverend Raven Miller shall lead us in a blessing of our communion table. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for the awesome opportunity to come together once again to worship you in spirit and in truth. Before we enter, even entered into this building, God, we want to say that we were grateful to wake up and know that you were still in control, God. And so with that being said, we come to you, God, to lay all of our pains at the altar even right now. So, God, for those who are grieving because of the loss of a loved one, you said that you would wipe away all tears, God. So we pray that you would meet them even right now and be their comforter. For those, God, that are in the hospital rooms, we ask, God, that your presence is made perfect even in that space and that healing would indeed go forth because by your stripes, we are healed, God. For those that are suffering from mental illness, God, help us to not shame them or make them feel bad, but to welcome them as our brothers and our sister and walk with them along their journey of healing as well. We speak peace that transcends all understanding for those that are suffering from depression, from those that are suffering from anxiety, from those who hear multiple voices. God, say peace, be still even right now in the name of Jesus. For our children, God, we speak a word of favor and a blessing over them even right now. God, we ask that you protect them in every situation that they find themselves in, God. Open up their mind to receive the wisdom from the elders, God, and help their crooked places to be made straight and help them to walk by faith even from a young and tender age as you are calling them even right now. And may we, God, exhibit this faith of the little children. You said, come to me as if we are little children, God, that our faith may grow and rest and be rooted in you, God. For those things that we are unsure of, we give it to you. For those things that give us worry and doubt, we give them to you. To those things that scare us, God, we give it to you. Knowing, God, that the blood that you shed on this cross, you did it just for me, just for you, just for us. And so, God, now we ask that you breathe the breath of life on these elements that we are about to partake, that remind us, God, of the sacrifice that you made for us and that we now will indeed sacrifice our life back to you. We will sacrifice, God, our time and our talent and our money, God, so that the kingdom can go forth, God, so people can know that hope is still available at this altar. Love is still available at this altar. Joy is still available at this offer. The answer to our prayer are still at this altar, God. So we stand on faith and stand on business knowing that you are still in control, God. So bless these elements, God, as we take them and we believe and trust you even when we cannot trace you. It's in your holy name that we do praise and give your name all the glory, all the honor, and in the praise. Amen and amen. Beloved, we gather at this table to celebrate the greatest love story ever known. For God so loved the world that God gave. And when God gave us his son, his son was willing to make that ultimate sacrifice, surrender his life into human hands. And scripture reminded us on last week that they beat him and flogged him, that they spat in his face, that they forced him to carry a 350-pound wooden beam up a hill. And when he reached the top of that hill, they took nails put him between his wrist and nailed him to that cross, took a spike and speared it into his feet to nail him there, placed a crown of thorns upon his head, and he hung there in agony for three hours until the asphyxiation of lungs took his last breath. He carried all of that pain, all of that shame and that sacrifice so that you and I might know what love 
and freedom and joy could really look like. This is the gift that he gives to us. He loved us before he loved his own self. And because he loved us, we are reminded to carry his commission to go out and love others. So in this Easter season, when we remember the agony and the horror of what he endured, we come to this table also mindful of those who are enduring agony and hurt in this present moment. We remember those who are being abused and tortured in our nation's prisons and jails. We remember those who are suffering silently under the abuse of domestic violence. We remember those who find abuse and horror seeking refuge at our nation's borders. And we remember those who are living in Jesus' homeland who right now today are being bombed and tortured and wounded in horrific ways. We remember those who suffer like our Christ. And as they suffer, we make our commitment to not be indifferent, to not cause harm with our words or our actions, but indeed, as we partake of these elements, our prayer is that we may learn to love him the way he so wondrously loves us and learn to love others in the very same way. Let us prepare now to receive the bread and body of our Lord and Savior.
by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. So heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss, and my heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about Violently broken because he stood with the least of these. As we eat of this bread, let us be reminded of his sacrifice and our commission to stand with the downtrodden. Let us break bread and eat together. And in the cup is a memorial of the blood shed on the cross of Calvary. This blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins and the redemption of our souls. In gratitude, let us drink it together. Beloved, Scripture teaches us that after the disciples shared in this meal, they left to sing hymns. Likewise, when we consider the gift of Jesus' amazing sacrifice and the gift of our salvation, we too lead this table rejoicing in song, for indeed he loves us so. Continue to move forward into the heart of worship. Allow me to lift up a few words of announcements. Ushers, as always, we got seats down front. Y'all know I'm lonely every Sunday. Uh, there's no need for our friends and family to be stuck in the back looking for a seat. We got plenty of space down front. Amen and praise God. Y'all make me feel like my breath stinks sometimes because y'all want to sit way back there and nobody want to sit down here. And I may, I, I'm doing better, you know, with the mouthwash and all of that. I I'm, I'm promise y'all it won't be too harsh if you sit right down front. Amen and praise God. Beloved, let me lift up a few words of announcements. We are so excited and delighted by what God is going to do in next Sunday as we gather in this place. We don't have a whole lot of special events in the life of our church, but next Sunday indeed is a special one as we gather together to rededicate this sanctuary back to the glory of God and rejoice for all that God has done to restore this space. And as we pray over and dedicate our new space for our youth downstairs. We are so delighted that right now our children's church and our teen church are worshiping in their new home today, and we are grateful indeed for the chance that we have to dedicate this space back. So I want to encourage you all to join us, especially some of our friends who live locally in the area who always tune in online. Would you join us in person as we celebrate this monumental occasion? We got a special project that we're all going to need our hands together collectively to put together to dedicate this space, and so I want to encourage you to come ready 
to try something new in worship, but also to celebrate with us as we welcome back Brother James Greer and company, one of the well-beloved favorites of this city. That amazing music ministry is going to lead us in worship, and then I'm just humbled and delighted um, to welcome my pastor, who I served under for three years during my graduate school time in New York. He's flying out to be with us, to preach us the Word of God, and so it's going to be an amazing and powerful weekend. I want to encourage you to be here, and then also do us this favor. Um, text your friends, your family, folk in your group chats. Let them know the church is back open. There's some folk we have not seen since we closed on Super Bowl Sunday, and we want to let them know the good news that we are back in this place, that we're excited. Um, that our sanctuary is restored and we get to pray over this new space. Also, as we move into the month of April, we're grateful that our next season of Increase Our Faith starts tomorrow. Somebody say tomorrow. And I want to thank the 100 of you who signed up to register for a class. You are getting ready to experience an amazing treat. Listen, we are lenient with our registration. We know some of you all were late to register when you were in school for class. And so, same way in church, uh, you can still register today to be a part of an Increase Our Faith class. I want you to know that it's not too late for you to experience what God is doing through these amazing times of instruction. So use that QR code on the screen if you have not already to register for a class or two. Uh, many of them begin tomorrow. Tomorrow we have the yoga classes that will start next week on the 15th, but we're grateful for the opportunity to increase our faith. Now previously we had said that these were going to be an in-person only experience, but we're grateful we had many more volunteers step up and they are going to out now be allowed to stream these classes on Zoom, and so we're grateful um, for those who can't be with us. To our online and our extended family, um, you all can now register to join us on Zoom and we'll send that information to you this week. Um, now I said that y'all to our extended family. Um, those of you who can be here, because uh, you know you live right up the street, please come and be a part of our in-person classroom experience. Uh, we are, for Increase Our Faith, we bring together some teachers and instructors from outside of our church, from across the Twin Cities. They're coming to teach for us, and I would hate for them to come all the way to fellowship just to teach to an empty room and a camera. And so if you are here and you know you can be here in person for your class, please, I, please be here in person. But know however you choose to join us, we are going to experience God move in our faith in a mighty way. As God continues to bless our church, we also know that God is doing some amazing things in our community, and I'm grateful to share with you ways that you can be engaged beyond the church walls. Um, Fellowship family, you know I say all the time that God calls us to not be a reactionary church, but to be a proactive church. Uh, we don't react once things take place in our community. We try to be ahead of the game to make sure you are engaged and involved in what is going on around us. I want to let you know that today in our atrium after service, we've got representatives from the Minnesota Department of Transportation here. They're going to be sharing information about the upcoming project for I-94 and 252. Um, in case you're not good with geography, I-94 is that highway right there that more, most of us take to get to church. Um, and we know we got a large population of our family that lives in Brooklyn Park who will be directly impacted by the work on 252. So there's a virtual public meeting coming up on Thursday of this week at 5 p.m. And we want to encourage those who know you'll be affected by this project, to so please stop by and be there. Make sure your voice is heard. They tell me construction is going to begin in 2028, but they're hearing opinions and voices right now. I said construction is going to begin in 2028. They want to hear your voice and your opinion right now. What we don't want to do is wait till something happens in 2028 and then complain about, oh, and look what they did to mess up the highway right by my house. This is your chance to be proactive and not reactive, and so we're grateful for the chance that we have to participate in this virtual meeting on Thursday. Also in our community, we're grateful we've been invited to join other communities of faith at the state capitol on this Thursday morning at 11 a.m. for Smoke Free Generations Day at the Capitol. For those of you who are not aware, Smoke Free Generation is a collaborative, a multi-faith uh, multi collaborative that is working to end the sale of flavored commercial tobacco products in our community and throughout our state. We know the way in which certain industries target our community specifically and specifically our children. And we're trying to put an end to those abusive practices to reduce some of the health care disparities that we see far too often. I didn't get enough claps here, so I'm going to say it as a pastor can say it. I, one thing I really don't like to do, Brother Billy, is when I preach unnecessary funerals. When I'm sitting up here and I know somebody in the casket died by preventable causes, that if we could have just done something more to bridge the gap and close the disparities, that we could live longer and healthier and more productive and fulfilling lives. 
And so this is one of the ways in which we do that. We want to encourage your voice to be heard. If you can't join us at the Capitol on this Thursday, there are also representatives from Smoke Free Generation who will have postcards in the atrium. You all know our postcard campaigns are a very effective way for us to make sure our legislators are being held accountable. They all love to come in here during November time. We want to make sure they hear our voices throughout the rest of the year so they can actually do the work that makes a difference in our neighborhood. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Also, we're grateful. Um, so many things are happening in the month of April. On the same day, on Thursday the 18th in the evening, um, the African American Leadership Forum will be here at our church hosting a powerful event called a Moral Homecoming, and we encourage you to register for that event. On the following Friday, on the 19th at 6 p.m., we'll have another iteration of our Altered Young Adult Ministry, a spiritual growth gathering for ages 25 to 35. And then on Saturday the 20th, we'll have coffee and conversation at 10 a.m. here at the church. That's our time for open Q&A and questions and feedback and dialogue between pastor and people. So we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to share. So many opportunities, many more on our website and on our social media pages at Fellowship MSP. I just encourage you to do this. Get plugged in. Get involved in one thing. Show up somewhere and exercise your faith outside of Sunday morning and watch and trust that God's going to bless you in a mighty way. That's all I have to lift up in words of announcements. Now I just want to know where are my cheerful givers? Where are all the saints of God who are motivated and excited? to give back to the God who's given so much to us. Our ushers are coming now. If you have cash or check today, would you do us the honor of just waving a hand? Our ushers will come to you with an offering envelope, and you can put cash or check in that envelope and then deposit it in one of the black boxes outside of our sanctuary, in our hallways, in our atrium. But the easiest way is to give online, to use that QR code there on the screen, to head over to our website, fellowshipmb.org slash give. That's fellowshipmb, as in missionarybaptist.org slash give, and there we can all give and participate in this act of worship. Fellowship, we begin this month of April by renewing our commitment to generosity and stewardship. We believe in this church that every member gives something every month, so we are starting the month off right on this first Sunday in our act of worship through giving. For those of you who want to give today above and beyond the tithe, there is a fun category in online giving that will allow you to contribute to the restoration season fund. That fund will help us to finish some of the work that you see around our campus as we complete the work of restoring our sanctuary and building a home that our youth can enjoy and flourish in. However you choose to give today, we're grateful for generosity. We're going to pray over these gifts. Our music ministry will bless us in song, and then we will prepare to receive a word from the Lord. Would you bow and be in prayer with me? Amazing and wonderful Savior, we continue to stand in awe of your great love for us, your wonderful mercy, your blessings, and all the many ways in which you continue to provide and restore. Lord, we stand here back in this sanctuary, God, recognizing that you continue to bless us in ways seen and unseen. And God, out of our gratitude, we now give joyfully and cheerfully back to you, knowing, oh God, that as we release our funds into your care, that you will breathe on them, bless them, multiply them, and use them, oh God, to do amazing work here in North Minneapolis and beyond. So God, we thank you for the lives that are being changed through our giving. We thank you for those hearts that are equipping themselves and committing to giving right now. I thank you, oh God, for every person who's giving for the first time, for people who are coming back to trusting and being in relationship with you. And God, we pray for those who don't have the ability or capacity to give in this season. God, whatever our reality is, we thank you that you are Lord over our finances and that you will lead us into every good and promised land. So Holy Spirit, do what only you can. Bless these gifts. And as we release these gifts into your care, we pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive the word that you want to plant into our spirits. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh in this place. Speak to our hearts and give us a word that will equip us to face whatever lies in the week ahead. God, you know your servant is not worthy to stand behind your sacred, sacred desk and preach your word. But God, I pray you would do what you've done so many times before. Allow your strength to be made perfect in my weakness. Holy Spirit, do thy will. Do thy will, Holy Spirit. And we'll be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In the name of the greatest gift giver, we do pray and say amen and amen. Seems like it's 
your friends turn away and you're all alone, alone, all alone. Tell me what do you give when you've given your all and seems like you never make it through. Child, you just stand when there's nothing else to do. You just stand. Watch the Lord see you through. And after you've done all you can, you just stand. Yeah.
worshipers who've had some long nights where you had to wait and pray and weep and you could not get to sleep, but somewhere late in the midnight hour, God began to touch and God began to speak and God began to move and you think about where you were in that night when you thought everything was over and yet God somehow gave you the strength to live to see another day. You can rejoice and say that you're still standing. Through it all, through it all, he's been faithful. After I've done all I can. Say yeah. try to pick up where I left off on last weekend there we began our conversation the traditional reading of the first part part of the Easter mornings of the Easter Sunday story um, but there are some verses that came after where we talked about last week that I believe are helpful you all know that Easter really in the Christian tradition it's not just a day but it begins a season um, and during these next several weeks, we should be considering the gift and the meaning of the resurrection and all that it has to teach us. And so I want to invite you back to where we stopped last week. Come back to Mark chapter 16, the final chapter of Mark's gospel, the 16th chapter. And when you found Mark chapter 16, I invite you to come down and meet me at verse number 9, where we'll begin our reading on this morning. Mark chapter 16. Beginning at verse number nine, you will find words similar to these as they're recorded in the New Revised Standard Version of God's Holy Word. Now, after Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with Jesus while they were mourning and weeping. But when they heard that Jesus was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven themselves as they were sitting at the table, and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. Jesus said to them, go into all the world 
and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. Look at verse 14 for me. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven themselves as they were sitting at the table, and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. Thus far, the word of God. As you rest yourselves this Sunday morning, I want you to pray with me on this sermon subject. How many times do I have to tell you? How many times do I have to tell you? Beloved, let me begin by offering some words of recap because last week was Easter and I know that many of you got the itis right after church and so you don't remember a thing I said. Um, but if you've been doing your homework and reciting our declaration, you remember that our declaration this week was intended to remind us of the fact that we are not called to solve every problem. We are called to trust God in every situation. And when we trust God, we end up moving towards problems that we would otherwise avoid. And so, Fellowship, I wanted you to know that God really can only use you if you learn how to move towards the problem. And in fact, as we move towards the problem, you'll discover that the problem might actually be a wonderful opportunity full of potential and possibility. We also learned last week that anxiety can only win if we allow it. That the good news of the Easter story is that Jesus won victory over death, hell, and the grave. And if he could conquer all of that, then surely he's got the victory over everything that's been trying to assault your mental well-being. So you, you may get anxious from time to time, but God will give you the strength to conquer what used to control you. It, it won't rob you of your joy. It can't steal your peace. It certainly shouldn't snatch that beautiful smile off of your face because whatever it is that you've been anxious over, God said, it's already handled. God can only use you if you move towards it. Anxiety can only win if you allow it. And finally, we celebrated the fact that the resurrection is real even if you don't see it. There were so many people connected to the life and ministry of Jesus who never got to see the risen Savior. And you and I have never got to see the risen Savior. But that's all right because the proof of the resurrection isn't found in what we see. The proof of the resurrection is found in the fact that I'm living, moving, and breathing on Sunday, April 7th. You and I are still breathing today even though there are so many things that should have taken us out. So many days when your world fell apart. So many moments when death should have been the outcome. But because Jesus conquered death 2,000 years ago, he gave me victory and freedom. So now every day I get to walk in resurrection power, in resurrection joy, in resurrection love. I've never seen him, but his power lives inside of me, so I get to experience life and life more abundantly. I didn't see the resurrection, but I know it's real because somewhere along the way, he brought me back from death to life. All right, now, now that being said, there are still some crucial lessons we learn from those people who were privileged to see the risen Savior. Everybody didn't get to see him, but in his omniscient wisdom, he selected a few key individuals and he appeared to them after he had risen with intentionality. He had to make himself known to at least a few folk so the message of the resurrection could be proclaimed. So allow me to spend this afternoon highlighting the second half of Mark chapter 16 because there's some nuggets here that I believe will bless your life. The Bible says that after he rose, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene and she went and told the folk who had been with Jesus but they would not believe the good news. 
After that, in verse number 12, he appeared to two other disciples who were walking out into the countryside. When they realized that Jesus had risen from the dead, they turned around, dropped what they were doing, went back and told the disciples the good news, but they still would not believe it. Jesus has now spoken to three different individuals who are so amazed by this miracle that they drop everything to go share the good news with Jesus' friends who are weeping and mourning. But all three of these people strike out. All three of them fail to persuade the disciples to believe. So now Jesus has to take matters into his own hands. Carlos, he's got to go pay a visit to those 11 jokers who after three long years still don't seem to get it. Verse 14 tells us that Jesus appeared to the 11 and he upbraided them. Y'all, he scolded them for their lack of faith and for their stubbornness since they couldn't believe those who had already seen him after he had risen. Church, Jesus is angry in this passage. I know that's hard for some of you to believe because you only know a tender and soft and caring Jesus. But that Greek word there literally means that he railed at them, that he reviled them. He is highly upset at their lack of faith. And it makes sense because not only have these disciples chosen to disregard the testimony of the three people Jesus trusted, but also these disciples have clearly disregarded much of what he told them during those years they were hanging out together. Jesus is frustrated here because to these 11 the resurrection should not be a surprise. He already told them way back in Mark chapter 8 that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And Mark chapter 8, round verse 32, it says that he said all of this quite openly that he is openly teaching about his death and his resurrection months before it even takes place. Fast forward to Mark chapter 9. At verse 30, it says that they went on from there and they passed through Galilee. He didn't want anybody to know he was passing through, for he had been teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. If the prediction in Mark chapter 8 and Mark chapter 9 weren't enough, in chapter 10, he completes the trifecta. He takes the 12 aside again, and he begins in Mark chapter 10 to tell them what was going to happen. He says, look, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death, hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him, and after three days, he will rise again. Three times he tells them exactly what's going to happen. Three times he gives them the script, the playbook, the whole synopsis. And he doesn't use parables or metaphors. No, he makes this teaching clear and plain. And then after all of it goes down, he sends three different people to tell them, hey, good news. Jesus worked everything out just like he said it would. And yet, even though they had three predictions and three revelations, they still didn't have enough faith to embrace the good news. Kirsten, I can only imagine Jesus raising his voice to ask the question, how many times do I have to tell you? I mean, can you think about how he must have felt? He's repeatedly told them what would happen, and he's told them what has happened, and they still don't have the faith to believe. He was direct. He was clear. He made sure everything happened according to schedule. It was in three days, and yet the disciples were still too stubborn to believe. So Jesus has to pull up on them and ask, how many times do I have to tell you? 
Listen, I, I, I'm not trying to stress out any of the parents in the house today because I know there's a few folk in this sanctuary who've been raising that question far too many times this week alone to your toddler or to your teenager. You've told them, you've been so clear about what they should not be doing, and yet every time you look up, as soon as you get home from work, they're doing the very thing you told them not to do. So now you're yelling across the room, how many times do I have to tell you? And forgive me because I know there's some folk in this place who aren't hearing that phrase from a parent's perspective. Uh, but I'm actually triggering you right now because there were a whole lot of moments in your own childhood where you heard somebody say, how many times do I have to tell you? And it wasn't long before you were knocked out after hearing that phrase. For many of us, it's one thing to disobey in a singular moment. Oh, but to be repeatedly disobedient, that's a deadly sin in most black households. There was likely to be some force applied to your backside after mama said, how many times do I have to tell you? And church, I would suggest that in the same way our parents get frustrated with us, that Jesus also gets tired of our poor listening skills that when we repeatedly disregard him, we are testing his patience. That if there's one thing that gets on Jesus' nerves, it's our lack of faith. In Jesus' eyes, there's nothing wrong with failure or guilt or depression or fear. He can provide grace for all of that. But when we are stubbornly stuck in seasons where we refuse to exercise our faith, that's where Jesus has to upbraid us. That's when he has to scold us. When we repeatedly ignore the wonderful news that he shared with us, that's when he has to get us back in line. Listen, I see this may not be the word you want to hear, but I'm trying to help 20 of you all in here and 40 online because there is no reason why you should hear good news and reject it. I said there is no, there is no reason why you should hear good news and reject it. There's no reason why God should speak a prophetic promise over your life and you deny it. There's no reason for the Holy Spirit to tell you you are healed, but you still behave like you're sick. God's voice ought to be enough to activate your faith. You shouldn't need to see proof when you believe in God's power. If God said it, then surely it will come to pass. And it doesn't matter what storm and what chaos is going on in my life. I will continue to walk by faith and not by sight because I believe that he's sovereign. And if he said it, he shall perform it. And while I'm waiting on him to perform it, I don't have to stress out. I don't have to worry. But I can sing the testimony of the old saints. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise. All right, y'all are here for me today. Y'all see that clock is running. Let me offer some principles so we can um, get out of here on time. Here's the first principle. You have got to embrace angelic assignments. Your faith will never function at the level it's supposed to until you embrace the angels who've been assigned to your life. Every important word you need to hear will not come in your individual prayer time. Sometimes the most critical messages we need to receive are carried to us by other people. That's why God ordains mentors to guide you and challenge you. That's why you've been given a pastor to pour into you. That's why when you joined this church, we assigned a deacon to pray with you. That's why hopefully you've got some good friends, not the kind who are always taking from you, but the kind who know how to invest words of possibility and potential into your spirit. My prayer is that you've got the right people around you who know how to speak life into you. Uh, but George, m most times the issue is not the presence of good people. Most times the issue is our unwillingness to listen. Oftentimes, when the word isn't packaged in the right person, we'll ignore the message. We forget that God can use anybody, which means sometimes God will send a message through people you don't approve of. Uh, you're looking at me funny, but I'm right in the text. Notice who Jesus picks as the first messenger. It's Mary Magdalene. 
And as I mentioned on last week, there really, if you read the whole gospel closely, there really isn't much to know about Mary Magdalene. All we really have to know about her background is Mark's footnote that highlights the fact that Jesus had cast seven demons out of her. Jesus cast seven demons out of her. And maybe that's all the disciples needed to know to dismiss her. They just knew something about her past. They knew the details of those demons that she had been wrestling with. They judged her because of her struggles with mental health. And even though Jesus had clearly cast the demons out, he had delivered her from that season, they couldn't hear the message because they were too busy judging her past. Let me help you. Don't allow one chapter to define somebody's whole life. You will only ever see the highlights of somebody's life. So while you're busy judging them for the mistake they made in one moment, you're missing the way God could use them to be a blessing in your life. Yeah, they might have a past. And sure, there's some gossip surrounding their name. But God can still use them to be his mouthpiece. Uh, maybe you know something about their past, or maybe you were conditioned not to like them just because of their social status, their race, or their gender, or whatever. But while you're thinking about all of that mess, you're forgetting the fact that Jesus doesn't believe in stereotypes. Jesus believes in unconditional love, which means the love you need might not come in the package that you're looking for. But if they're bringing good news to you, you need to hear them out anyway because they just might be the angel. God is assigned to your life. They refuse to believe Mary Magdalene, but they also refuse to believe these other two unnamed disciples. From context, we assume that this is Cleopas and his companion, the ones we read about traveling down the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. And again, we don't know much about these two brothers either. We don't know, all we know about them is that they were disciples, but they weren't a part of the original 12. Paul, they were disciples, they just weren't a part of that posse. So it raises the occasion for me to ask, can you embrace angels who aren't a part of the inner circle? I, I said, can you embrace angels who aren't a part of the inner circle? Can you appreciate it when God uses an outsider? Or do they have to be credentialed and come from the creme de la creme for you to even give them the time of day? <laughs> Fellowship, sometimes we can develop a rigid arrogance that makes us look down on anybody who's not familiar. Because they're new and they're different and they didn't grow up with us, we don't think that they can be a blessing to us. What's that thing I was reading that they say about Minnesota, that if you don't make friends here by the time you're in the fifth grade, that you won't make any friends at all because we're not a welcoming environment? Listen, we better push against that trend. You better learn how to open up yourself and realize that God is always in the blessing business, which means God will bless you with new relationships and new partnerships. God is sending amazing people into our city and into this church, and I refuse to miss the people being assigned to my life because I only want to rock with the people who I've known for the last 20 years. Can I be real about it? Some of the folk you've known for the last 20 years, you should have cut off 10 years ago. Big Mama said, sometimes you got to prune the branch to make room for healthy vegetation to grow forth. And you can't let what's died off make you miss the new blessing that's about to spring forth. So you need to learn how to keep your heart open to the possibility of somebody new. Doesn't matter if they weren't in the original 12. If they're showing up with good news and the right attitude, then I will hear them out and allow their perspective to strengthen my faith. You have got to embrace angelic assignments. And here's number two, you've got to exit stale patterns. Yeah, you may want to write that down. You need to exit stale patterns. I believe, beloved, that you have not experienced the fullness of Easter until you found the courage to exit the patterns that used to be behind you. It is easy 
for believers to get stuck in routines that are comfortable emotionally, but rob us of spiritual purpose and destiny. And so we develop these patterns that become the safety net that guard us from all the unknowns that God is trying to lead us into. Notice why the disciples can't receive the good news of the resurrection. It's verse 10. She went out and she told those who had been with Jesus while they were mourning and weeping. While they were mourning and weeping. She brought the message while they were in a state of severe grief. And on some level, that's to be expected. You've been spending time with a beloved, charismatic leader for three and a half years, and then he gets executed by the state in his 30s? That's more than enough reason to be grieving. It's perfectly appropriate for them to be in mourning. Minister Amber, the difficulty is that we still have to be able to receive a word even while we're weeping. Your ears need to be able to receive a message even while you're in mourning. Because here's what I know God will do. God has the capacity to sympathize with your pain and speak to your heart at the same time. And too many of us will miss what God is saying on Sunday because we're still lamenting what we experienced on Friday. I said too many of us will miss what God is saying on Sunday because we're still lamenting what happened on Friday. Don't you miss your word because you've allowed grief to shut your ears. You got to remember what Jesus taught you. He said, blessed are those who mourn. You got to remember what the psalmist said. He said that God is near to the brokenhearted and that God saves those who are crushed in spirit, which means that the very moments where you are grieving and weeping might be the very moment where God draws near to you to tell you something that you cannot afford to miss. So let your tears flow, but keep your ears open at the same time. I said, let your tears flow, but keep your ears open at the same time. Because the new assignment, the breakthrough, the amazing creative idea might come during your season of grief. I've got a newsflash for you. Good things can happen even while you're still grieving. I I wish I had a church at 11 a.m. Good things can happen even while you're still grieving. Uh, Andre, they they can't receive the word from Sister Mary. Uh, So later on, Jesus himself shows up. And when he shows up, he finds them sitting at a table. You read your Bible. He finds them sitting at a table. Now, the other Gospels make it clear that not only were they sitting at a table, but they were locked in a house. They're locked in a holding pattern that isn't allowing them to exercise their spiritual gifts. So Jesus goes to them and he says one simple word, go. Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole of creation. Stop sitting at this table. Stop sitting here locking yourself in the house. Talking to each other about last Friday, which you can't even fix no way. Stop focusing on that moment and remember that I called you to change the world. Remember that I commissioned you to carry on my legacy. Remember that I've given you the Holy Spirit so you might be empowered to bless and transform lives. You're stuck here at this table, but I need you to go out into all the world. Uh, Shauna, I don't have long to stay here, but this is such an important word to those of us in 21st century church. Because if there's one thing the church is good at today, it's sitting at tables. Oh, God. We, we are so good, especially in the Baptist church, of sitting at tables. We love table talk. We're good at calling a committee, calling a church meeting, discussing long-term strategy, raising motions, reviewing minutes, recycling old debates. We are very good at table business. But we struggle with getting up from the table and going out to change the world. Can I be really real? We We struggle with getting up from the table and even walking down the street. How many homes in this neighborhood have we not spoken to? Because we're good at being at the table, 
Listen, I don't want to step on some toes, but here's the reality. If the Lord told me to tell you that we had been called to go evangelize in St. Paul, most of y'all would look at me crazy and say, oh, no, Pastor, that, that's too far. We don't go way over there across the river. Listen, Jesus did not call us and equip us to stay stuck sitting at the safety of the table. We are too gifted we are too blessed. We are too anointed to settle into patterns that are keeping us from actually serving our Savior. He's told us to go. He's commanded us to move. He got up out the grave. The least you can do is get up out your seat. I think I'll say that again. He got up out the grave. The least you can do is get up out your seat and go serve him. I wish I had some faith-filled believers who refuse to stay stuck in safe patterns. You ought to pull on your neighbor, wake him up, and tell him it's time to go. Go, neighbor. Go because you weren't born to stay stuck here. Go because you weren't born to rest dormant in obscurity. Born because you weren't born. Go because you were born and destined to be a blessing to the whole of creation. Go. Oh. Oh, Jesus is saying, how many times do I have to tell you, you were born for more than this? Easter is your reminder to embrace angelic assignments, to exit stale holding patterns, and finally, if you do both of those things, God will ease your insecurities. Yeah, if you can embrace those assigned to you and exit the patterns that aren't serving you, then the third principle will happen automatically. God will ease your insecurities every step of the way. Amen. Sheila, the reason why most of us refuse to go is because we're not secure enough in ourselves to walk into the uncharted territory Jesus is calling us into. Jesus is always speaking to us, but because we're not disciplined in our prayer life, we don't actively hear his voice. But you know whose voice we listen to instead? You listen regularly to all of your insecurities, to all of your self-doubt, to all of your internalized anti-blackness. Yeah, we listen to everything that white supremacy culture tells us to believe about ourselves. All these voices that tell us that we're not good enough, they get plenty of airtime. Some of us, we honest, we wrestle with low self-esteem on a daily basis because we're inundated with all these cultural ideas that tell us we're not worthy. Now, I'm going to tell you what Jesus does for these insecure disciples. He does the same thing for you and me. He goes to these ones who are stuck in a holding pattern. And Deacon Tyson, he doesn't just tell them to go into all the world and proclaim the good news. But in addition to the commission, he also gives them a reassurance. He reassures them by saying, these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. If they lay their hands on the sick, the sick folk are going to recover. God, I wish I had some folk who could shout over Bible. He says these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes. If they drink something deadly, it won't even harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, the sick folk going to recover. Jesus says, as you go and do this work I'm calling you to do, you will see signs along the way. You will see evidence of the fact that you don't have to work alone. You will see signs that will show you without a doubt that there's a greater power working through you to help you accomplish what you have to do. So I know you don't you will cast out demons. I know you're shy about your spirituality, but you will speak in tongues. I know you're fearful because if you really use your gifts, there are going to be some people who will try to harm you. But God says the snakes and the poison and everything they use to destroy you won't even have the power to harm you. Because if God be for you, who can be against you? 
My time is up, but I believe there are signs that will accompany the step of every believer. You don't have to walk alone. You don't have to stay stuck in fear. If you simply go, he will show you everything that you need to see. Miracles, signs, and wonders are just over the horizon. All you have to do is release your insecurities. And as you release your insecurity, God will trade all of that for blessed assurance. I rose to tell somebody this morning that you will discover your gift and you will share your voice and you will live into the fullness of your potential and you will command the attention of the crowd and you will win a soul to Jesus Christ and you will inspire the next generation and you will leave your mark on the world and you will and you will and you will and you will. And you will. Uh. I, I don't care how many days you wake up scared. If you can just press past the fear, God will show you a sign to remind you that you are doing exactly what he created you to do. There is no doubt he can't deliver you from. No fear he can't lift you out of. No insecurity that he cannot extinguish. Big Mama said, if you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. So take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Leave behind every insecurity, every self-doubt, every negative thought. You can leave that behind. Because Jesus has already risen from the grave. So we're not waiting on him. No, he's waiting on us. He's waiting on us to get up from the table and go. Would you bow and be in prayer with me? Amazing God, we thank you for how you meet us in moments of weakness, insecurity, and regret. And yet, oh God, even in those moments when we are confused about ourselves and our worth and our value, you remind us how loved we are. We thank you, O oh God, for extending us patience in those moments when we have walked away from our purpose, sat locked in rooms, sitting at tables, frustrated with our past failure. We thank you, O oh God, that you have reminded us that whatever happened on that Friday, God, on Sunday, something new can begin. So God, we pray that today might be the beginning of a new journey where we walk with you, where we trust you, where we live out our faith where we share the good news and proclaim the wondrous work of the resurrection to all who we encounter. God, may this be the day where we leave behind all of our shame and simply trust the assignment you have spoken over our lives. Or God, may this be the day for one of your daughters and your sons to finally say yes to your amazing love. Right now, oh God, I pray for someone who's been hearing the voice of Jesus but they've never said yes and made that step of surrender. God, may this be the day where they say yes, where they say, Lord, I trust you. And may this be the day where they get to know your amazing love. Holy Spirit, thank you for loving us through it all. No matter how many times you have to tell us, no matter how often you get frustrated with us, we believe, oh God, that you are increasing our faith and allowing us to go into all that you've called us. So for that, we thank you, we trust you, and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You thought I was worth saving. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. So you cleaned me up inside. You thought I
good news today. You are worthy, you are loved, you are valuable. Jesus sees you exactly where you are. My sister, my brother, if you've never said yes to the amazing love of Jesus Christ, if you've never had God remind you and show you of how worthy and precious you are, before you leave today, there's a table in our atrium. Please stop by there and tell our church leaders you want to get to know more about Jesus. They'll be glad to answer any questions they, you have about the Christian faith and to share with you more about God's amazing plan of salvation for your life. Or perhaps you already know Jesus Christ, but you're not connected in a church home where you're growing in faith and in family. Listen, beloved, we would love for you to be a part of what God is doing here at Fellowship Minneapolis. Our church is growing, but that growth would not be complete without you. So would you stop by that same welcome table? Perhaps you're online today. Would you use the link that's going up in the chat even now? It'll allow you to connect with us virtually and be a part of the amazing new members class that we got coming up on this Saturday. Whatever your reality is, we end every service by lifting up a declaration of faith. We believe in taking the sermon home with us. And that way these words will inspire us in the week that comes ahead. Fellowship, you've already heard the declaration this week. It's real simple. But we're giving ourselves an instruction and a reminder by simply saying one word, go. We are going to remind ourselves all week long that Jesus did not call us to stay stuck in any stale patterns, that God loved us too much for us to not embrace all of the potential that lies within us and the assignments that await ahead of us. So my sister, my brother, won't you lift your hands? Let's practice for this week real quick. Lift our hands all over this sanctuary and shout it with a loud voice. Say, go. Say it one more time. Say go. go. Say it three times with the Holy Ghost. Go. go. If you believe that in the front, put your blessed hands together as we thank God for what God is doing. Fellowship family, thank you so much for being in worship this weekend. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for pressing your way through the rain. We're so grateful for this time that we've had to share together. We go out into the amazing week that awaits us. As always, we thank you for your generosity and your giving. If you haven't given today, there's black containers in the atrium on your way out where you can give and support the ministry of this church. Also, again, a reminder, I hope to see some of you back in this place on next Sunday for a very special moment in the life of our church. To some of our local family who's watching online, would you do us the favor of coming in person next Sunday to be here and to celebrate with us as we have an amazing project we want to share. And then, of course, we want to make sure that we are good host to our guests. You all know one of our uh, aims and our strategic plan is five-star hospitality. And so as we have guests coming in to lead us in worship and preach the Word of God to us, we want to make sure they feel welcome. I hope I would, all right, there we go, amen. Um, so the way you make folks feel welcome, I, I know you got a smile. I know you may not use it early in the morning or at the middle of the day, but you've got a smile. It's beautiful. God loves it, and our guests would love to see your smile next week. So if you would come in here, smile at our guests, make them feel at home, it would help us to have a special and blessed rededication Sunday. Until I see you on that moment, let's have an amazing week. Let's enjoy our increase our faith classes. Let's continue to trust God's amazing plan for our lives. Let's pray one final time, receive our benediction, and we'll go out into the week that awaits us. Lord, we love you. We honor you. We adore you. We thank you for how your spirit has ministered to us in worship. We thank you, O oh God, that we can leave this place better than how we came in because we've heard your word and experienced your presence. Now, God, as we go, would you cover us, protect us, comfort us, and inspire us this week is our prayer. And we'll be careful to continue to glorify you and bless your name all week long. Now to the God who took nothing and created everything. To the God who breathes new life into dust so that dust may walk into destiny. To the God who resurrected our Savior so that the dust might be redeemed. And to the God who keeps heaven open so that the redeemed may continue to dream. To that God be glory, honor, dominion, and power from now until eternity and the redeemed dust who love the Lord said amen. amen, amen, and amen. Go in peace, Fellowship family. I love you. Have a great week.